Good evening. Welcome to the Maison Française. We um, are very happy to welcome you here for this very special event with, with Viggo Mortensen, who's here to present the film Far From Men, and will um, return to join us for a Q&A with Professor Madeleine Dobie after the film screening is over. This is, of course, a film that was um, based on a short story by Albert Camus called The Guest, and the film was directed by David Olhoffen and released in 2015. I'm just going to be very brief, um, and I would just like to express our deep gratitude to Viggo Mortensen for, for being present with us for this event. And uh, I'd like to thank the Albert Camus estate and Catherine Camus and Alexandre for um, partnering with the Maison Française to present this screening as well as tonight's reading by Viggo Mortensen of Albert Camus' lecture, The Human Crisis, which was originally delivered 70 years ago on this day at Macmillan Theatre. Tonight's event, like this one, has long been full, so if you're signed up and you have your program, for, please go there directly after the screening if you want to get in. Um, both of these events are presented as part of a series of events called Camus, A Stranger in the City, celebrating the 70th anniversary of Albert Camus' first and only visit to the United States. And um, it is, of course, a, a tremendous honor to welcome Viggo Mortensen to the Maison Française. He is a multi-talented, award-winning actor whose film credits include The Lord of the Rings Trilogy, The Two Faces of January, A Dangerous Method, the Road, Eastern Promises, and the History of Violence, among others. He is also uh, a multi-talented artist, a painter, a poet, a photographer, and the founder and editor of Percival Press. Um, so I'm going to um, keep my introductory remarks there, and I'll say a few more words before the Q&A, but I wanted to give him a chance to present the film. Viggo Mortensen. Bonjour, Madame, Monsieur. Soyez les bienvenus. Welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to this screening. Uh, I'll just be brief. You know, as she said, I'm going to come back afterwards and I'll try to answer as best I can any questions you might have about the movie or anything related to it. <clears throat> it was for me um, an honor to to work on this adaptation of 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 an Albert Camus uh, short story. Um, because he's an author and a philosopher and a person, a human being that I've, I've respected for, for a long time. His work, his unwavering uh, stance against war, against violence, and in favor of, of peaceful communication among all peoples. You know, he's just, it was in some way, as you'll see, those of you who know his work and a little bit about his life, there's there's a lot of him in the character I play. And this story, although it takes place in 1954, at the beginning of what we now call the, the Algerian War for Independence from France, um, there's a lot that can be applied. It doesn't take much thinking to realize that um, to the problems that we face today in terms of... <clears throat> lack of communication, intolerance, uh, misunderstanding, fanaticism, um, the struggle that an ordinary or person or ordinary persons, as, as the story is about two people, a friendship between two men who initially seem to be quite different, the, 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 how difficult it is for them, especially in times of war or, or imminent war, to, to find a way to, just to communicate just to see the other person, just to listen to the other person. And um, at its heart, though, it is a story about a friendship, uh, an unusual friendship, I guess you'd say, that might not have happened were it not for the obstacles that they face, you know, these conflicts. So, you know, I try to look at the bright side of things, you know, when things are going badly, when you have obstacles in your work or in your life, since you have no other choice, you either deal with them or you don't, what can you do in this situation? What does this situation bring out of you? What's, what's the best it can bring out of you, you know? And I think that's in part what this story is about, so. I know 
was very warm in here, where you felt like you were in Algeria. Maybe. <laughs> you were right. It was a great film. <laughs> I'm sure you will enjoy the screening of uh, Far From the Man and Juan de Zoma. Uh, we're privileged to have a few minutes, not very long, to discuss the film and related questions with Victor Mortensen. Uh, before we get going, I'd like to thank once again all of the organizers from Columbia's Maison Française, uh, the Camus Foundation, uh, for making this possible, uh, and especially um, graciously being here with us. Uh, I've been asked to remind everyone not to use uh, cell phones for photography, no photography, no recording, please. Um, so I think we have about 30 minutes, and I want to leave time for uh, everyone to ask questions. So maybe I'll just start with a couple of things, and then we'll, we'll see where it goes. How many people are in the, your class? There are some, I showed this film last semester in the class and this semester, so there were some students from both semesters here. I see one who's still here, two. So maybe, we'll, maybe we can put them on the spot later. <laughs> <laughs> Just be warned that that could happen. Uh, I'm Madeleine Dobie from the French department, and as, uh, as I've now uh, revealed, I did teach the class a couple of, the film a couple of times in classes. Um, it was very interesting. So maybe just to get started, let me ask you um, how you got involved in this project. And, um, and I'm wondering when you, you first met the director and the screenwriter, David Olhofen, whether there was already a finalized screenplay. Um, and if there was, whether it was in French and Algerian Arabic, mm. or you know, whether the screenplay evolved as the, the film was mm -hmm. being made. Um, what we ended up shooting was f fairly close to what I first saw. Um, some things were taken out as we went along in pre-production, just trimming the fat, sort of, you know, in terms of dialogue. And, and then in the editing of the movie, there are, there are some scenes missing from the early part. Um, the reason for that isn't that the, the, the scenes didn't work, but in a sense, you know, in, in watching the movie once he was editing it, the director felt that he needed to get on the road, so to speak, to get yeah. on the journey with the two men. And the initial stuff that was cut, which I really enjoyed doing, and which was all Arabic, was uh, there was a wedding. There were, well, there was a neighbor that we never see now, whose name was Mustafa, who was a, a friend of an older man who's lived I don't know, maybe a couple of kilometers from, from the schoolhouse, and whose daughter uh, was getting married, and because he's a friend of the family, and he had taught her when she was a little girl in that same school, uh, he went to the wedding, and he had to give a speech, and she was embarrassed, and it was, he had to dance, and all these things, and it was, it was very interesting. And just the relationship with Mustafa was, was, was interesting. But uh, in the end, I think the director felt that not only did he want to get on with the journey of the two men, but that he felt it was understood, more or less, that if the man had been there for a decade and all these different kids were there, he had done the effort of making connections in the community, otherwise he'd have no students, you yeah. know. And um, there was another scene which I really liked with the one they were on the trail already where they run across a, a woman, uh, an, an older woman, who has a grandson living with her, and I'm trying to convince her all, this is all in Arabic, and she was an Algerian actress, very good actress, um, theater actress, movie actress, to send her kid to school. And she's saying, no, I need him to work around here and for the harvest and so forth. And I was just sort of trying to cajole her, and we talked about the weather and this and that. It just showed how he did that. But it would have been nice, maybe some extended version someday. I think in France, actually, I think they are putting that on the Bonus DVD. CD. Some of them, yeah. But yeah, no, I, he, um, the reason that David uh, Olhoffen contacted me was because he, a producer of his, when he was writing it, he told his producer that, not that he was looking for me specifically, but an actor of my type, whatever that meant to him for this role. And, um, and then the producer happened to see something on the internet where I spoke a little bit of French, 
although not the French I had to speak for the movie, it was more like a Quebec uh, French, which is where I learned it from, in, in northern New York, where I was presenting a legendary hockey player on the, on the centennial of the Montreal Canadiens, uh, Guy Lafleur. And I was presenting him on the occasion of the centennial, and, um, and the producer saw this, a little bit of footage, and I said, you know, I think he speaks French or some kind of French. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should contact him. So they did. I got a, I, the question came to me, could you do a, an entire movie in French? And I said, well, it's not impossible. Um, I'd love to read the script. I read the script and I, I really loved it. And because Camus is, a, is an author that I've admired, as I said before the movie, uh, for a long time, uh, and because this character in some way uh, embodies him or his values in a lot of ways, which is maybe part of the reason you taught the movie. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, was it in conjunction with the short, with the book? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I met David and we spoke, and I said, "Well, you know, I'll have to work. I'll have to change my accent, speaking French." And what I didn't realize is that there's all this Arabic. That's completely new to me. <laughs> That's going to take some work. But strangely enough, as time passed and when we were actually shooting, I had for, you know, it took a, long, a while to get the money together. So I had many, many months, I had a year or something, on and off to keep working. So I, I translated with the help of a, of a Moroccan uh, man who's a friend of mine all of the script into Arabic just in case. You know, which was good because later on there were some moments where we said, well, maybe that, those words or that phrase could be Arabic as well, even scenes that were originally French. So I did that and enjoyed that. But as we were shooting, because I had to learn it from scratch, first with this Moroccan man and then with the guy who was with us every day, a man named Salah, who, who was Algerian, they had to sort of fine tune it so that it was a dialect from that region of Algeria and change certain words and all that. Because it was new to me, it wasn't, it was strangely easier most days than it was the French, because even though I thought, okay, I'm speaking like you guys, so you're the French crew, they said, no, 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 it's too nasal. I go, it's too nasal, yeah, you're doing that thing that they do over there in North America. So he would catch me out once in a while, and that was, that was, that was one of the, jobs that I had to do. But I, I never doubted it. The moment I read the script, I was, I, I, it was a wonderful story. And when I found out that um, uh, Beda Kateb was going to play Mohammed, uh, that, was, that was, made it even easier. He's a very fine actor, as, you, as you've seen. So um, the first moral of this story is learn French, and also learn Arabic. Um, since the, the film I think you, didn't you write something about French being important? Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, since the, the movie is being screened on the, uh, in the context of the Camus in New York festival commemorating the 70th anniversary of Camus' visit to New York, mm. I'd like to ask you a little bit about how you see um, you know, the film in relation to, to Camus, as you, you, know, you spoke about that already a little bit. So I think um, you, um, you evoked Camus' nonviolence, uh, his, you know, his um, uh, hatred of war, and connected it to your own opposition to uh, the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003, continued presence in Afghanistan and other places. I know that you uh, edited a volume Title: Twilight of Empire, mm -hmm. uh, Responses to Occupation, and it, you have some writing in that mm -hmm. in that volume. Uh, so I'm wondering how how you see this film connecting to those values and those concerns about um, violence today. Well, I mean, the, the the movie does not give you any easy answers any more than I suppose the author. Camus uh, was want to give easy answers, you know. Um, he was and is accused of being, at the very least, naive or unrealistic or, you know, pig-headed, simple-minded, um, 
everything, you know, under the, including a traitor and a reactionary, everything, because he 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 said things in a very plain way. Um, his his position of being against violence, against murder of any kind, his position that <clears throat> that there is no uh, there is no cause that justifies the murder of innocent people. You know, people say, well, it's easy to say, but we have to do this, we have to go to war. And he was saying, no, you don't. <laughs> we really don't, you know? And that, that is something that comes through in this movie, I think. But it's not easy. You, you can, that's, your, that's your principle, that's your point of view. Um, I mean, you may have to give your life to defend that principle, but but I don't think that he was saying, and I don't think this movie says that it's an easy thing to grapple with, you know. Uh, what I think is valuable about this movie for our times or any times is the fact that you can see two people who initially seem like they not only have nothing in common, but neither of them are particularly interested in learning about the other. And these are two men who are born in the same region of a very big country, and it's in, you know, they're, they're practically neighbors. Um, and yet, and because of that, <clears throat> at the very beginning, I think you could say that uh, my character looks at, at uh, Mohammed and thinks, yeah, well, I know what this person is like. I know all about this kind of person. I have my preconceptions, and likewise, Mohammed about him. I know everything about him. There's not really much he's going to show me. This is the guy that's going to take me. I'll have to tolerate that. That's the way it is. And I resent having to do this because I would rather stay and teach the kids. And it's sometimes the obstacles that we're faced with, or the things we're forced to do that we don't want to do. Sometimes those are the things we learn from, as it turns out. You know, and in this story, certainly that's the case by virtue of spending time together, being forced to spend time together, something that would not have happened if it weren't for this conflict, if it weren't for the crime that this young man committed. Um, they, they, they are surprised. They, are, they learn uh, things about someone who they didn't think there was anything to learn about. And they become interested. Mm -hmm. um, it's not some you know, Disney movie where they become the you know, the best friends, although if they ever run into each other again, which I think is improbable, um, I think they would be very happy to see each other, you know. There is a friendship that is forged there, an unusual friendship, an understanding. It doesn't mean they agree about everything, you know. And I think that's, that's what Camus was saying in a lot of his work, is that we don't have to become best friends, you know, but we ought to make an effort a special effort to listen to each other and to try to learn about the other person. Because in doing so, we're going to, at the very least, learn something about ourselves, you know? So, so the, the film does some things that Camus' story doesn't do, obviously. Um, in particular, it, it, it gives life, it fleshes out mm. the character of Muhammad, mm. played by Rida Kata beautifully. Mm. Um, uh, you know who's a, who's kind of a nameless, faceless figure, really, in the in Lot, in the guest, uh, as is the case in a lot of Camus novels set in Algeria. So that's one difference. And then I guess another. And he was he was often, as you know, he's been con and still is accused of of being racist or certainly neglectful in not giving names to these characters. Mm -hmm. um, and my argument in the case of this story, and also, let's say, The Stranger, you know, which is one where people uh, point this out a lot. And in fact, as you know, there's been an alternative version uh, sure. <laughs> of, that, of that novel. Right. Kamel Daoud's yeah. um, Merceau Investigation. Right. Mm -hmm. and, um, but I would say that in the case of this story, and perhaps The Stranger as well, what is the, the story is being told through the point of view of a specific character who doesn't, I mean, in, in the, the difference in the story is not only that you get to know Mohammed, but you, you get to see what happens on that journey, really, which you don't um, see very much of in the story. Um, 
But also because the, 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 the story, even though it was published in 1957, mm -hmm. is set before the onset of right. the, the rebellion and right. the War of Independence. So it's, there's an interesting you know, phenomenon there mm -hmm. where Camus doesn't describe what's actually happening at the moment that the story mm -hmm. is published. And the film, of course, does. Uh, but the story does deal with, eventually, um, slightly differently, but uh, as far as the end result, but he, the, 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 the subject of injustice to the, you know, to, to an Arab mm -hmm. uh, prisoner by the, by the French authorities, that is addressed because there is that choice. Yeah. If you go to this place and hand yourself in, you're not going to get a fair trial. You're not going to, there's only one right. result, which is you'll be hanged. Um, did you and David Olhofen and, and Reda Kateb have discussions about how the film relates to the story and what kind of um, you know, what kind of project this is in relation to? Yeah, we spoke about it a lot. I mean, um, as I've said, there were a lot of things that you know, even though it's set in 1954, that you can relate to what's happening now and the in the problem. Something that's always a problem when people, different peoples, don't don't have dialogue, or when governments um, prevent people from speaking to each other. I mean, a case in point is the way the movie was made. The movie was made; it was going to be shot in Algeria, mm -hmm. but I wanted to ask you about yeah, that. Yeah, logistically, it became, it, and, and the director went and scouted, and I also went there for some time before shooting because I wanted to hear the way people spoke. I wanted to go to places that Camus had been to. Um, things that are mentioned in the script, <clears throat> the church where he talks about having been married, um, the neighborhood he was raised in, places that were special to him, like Tipasa, the ruins, the Roman ruins on the coast, and other places. I also went to the east and to the west. I went to Constantine and other places. Um, and so even though he prepared this, he realized logistically in terms of the crew, the hotels, and even, it was just too complicated and it would be, the budget was small and we had a limited time. And he realized that in Morocco where many more movies are made, and especially international ones, ones that come from outside Morocco, um, it was just easier logistically and we shot very near the border in the same mountain chain, the Atlas Mountains, so the look of it was, was right. Um, which. David had seen before shooting, and I had seen as well. And also, and, and, and we made, we took care to um, to have someone there all the time. There were an Algerian who made sure that both Reda and I spoke that particular, the way that people would speak in that region as best as possible. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the movie was made with a crew that was made up of Moroccans and French and Algerians, and me and some others. That in itself was a success, I thought, because you have, as maybe some people know, uh, politically, Morocco and Algeria have had problems Differences. for a long time. But I found in talking to people in Algeria and in speaking to people in Morocco that it's not really the people that have the problem. This is an issue close to Camus heart, and in fact, the speech I'm going to talk, uh, I'm going to give tonight, he addresses this problem. It's not the problem is the politicians. The problem is. <laughs> is not the people. People have, have a tendency to get along and to be curious about one another, if left to their own devices, you know, if not convinced otherwise. Um, so anyway, the fact that it was made this way and, that, and the fact that the movie was, has been shown in movie theaters in Morocco and Algeria, in Palestine, where I went with David, which was a really interesting, we went and showed it in several places and did Q&As like this. Um, in, in Jerusalem as well, um, tells me, and France, obviously, in North America, that it's been shown in all these places, mm -hmm. that a distributor in Israel has bought the movie. That, to me, is a, is a positive development, mm -hmm. you know, Success. the way it was made and the fact that people are interested in seeing the story and that they relate it to their times, even if they've never read any of the author's work. Maybe I'll ask one last question, then I'll open it up. I'm, I'm uh, curious to hear a little bit more about your collaboration with Reda Kateb, who mm. is the great nephew of Kateb Yassin, mm. 
emblematic Algerian writer, obviously. I'm imagining that it must have been very moving for him yeah. to make this film set at the period of independence, you know, a moment when his, you know, his ancestor is, is becoming, emerging as that, um, that, that voice, that, um, that... Yeah, thing. no, it was really important to him. You could feel it. He, he didn't have to tell you that, just the way he gave himself to the task, you know, of, of, of creating this character. Um, and because he knew also that uh, Kate Biasin and um, Albert Camus were contemporaries, rivals, and in the end had mutual respect for each other, there was sort of a parallel journey that had happened with, let's say, the ancestors of these characters in some sense, mm -hmm. that we were mirroring in some way, a sort of a difficult journey to a to an understanding, let's say. Um, but yeah, no, I thought he did a wonderful job. I really enjoyed working with him. And because this movie is so much about the things that are not said, you know, the little, the gestures, the reactions. <clears throat> if you're just two people and one of those people doesn't have the gift that Reda uh, Kateb has to express himself with that sort of subtlety, then you're, you're kind of, you struggle, you know, but it was great. He was a great partner and we had a great time. There's a lot of silence in Camus' mm. writing and there's, I think it enters into the film as well. Mm. Uh, it's well done. Okay, so I, th I think there are probably a lot of questions. Let's try to keep them fairly concise. So. Uh, I had a question if you could just wait for the microphone, no, thank you. Sorry. I had a question about the title of the film, which when I saw the first long shot of the schoolhouse, I thought, yeah, it seems so isolated and far away, and obviously the relationship of Mohammed and Dabu is far from men. But towards the end of the film, perhaps because I'm a female viewer, I was so enchanted by the sequence with the women, in other words, and Angela Molina was one of my favorite actresses of the 1980s, and it seemed like the film was positing how um, the world of women is truly you know, a possibility that is far from men because it's the only place where guns have to be abandoned mm. in order for the sort of fleshly pleasures to exist. I was just curious, yeah. you know, how you felt about that. Although it must be said that there are, there, there have been and continue to be quite murderous females as well. <laughs> uh, in the armies of the world, in the terrorist organizations of the world, it's, it has always been that way. But I, I, I get your point. I, I think that the, the, the Grand Desom, Far From Men, I think it's that sort of old-fashioned way of saying men, meaning mankind, humankind, men and women. And yeah, it's the initial isolation that you see, but it's also both characters are sort of like hermits. They are not men of very few words, of very little overt social interaction, especially when they took out the scenes where the wedding and all. So you just see two guys that are just like like the rocks that you see, you know, they're just like very hard to get inside them, inside their heads or their hearts. And I think it has to do with that. Um, and, but that sequence that you speak about, about the women, and also the scene when we're captive of the, of uh, Sliman and the others, where he asked me about if I'd ever been with women, what's it like, and I talk about my wedding day and so forth. And uh, there's something that he realizes in speaking about that and also subsequently in going to down to his to Berzina to his uh, to his hometown his native town and and going to the whorehouse and all that he's doing it as a as a gift to his friend he's like well I'll give you everything I have I think it's important that he not die since he's decided he wants to die that he ex ex experienced this however clumsily it might go, just the touch of a, of a woman, you know, uh, that kind of, I don't know, he just senses that would be good for him, for his, this man he's coming to understand and be interested in. 
And, uh, and by doing this for someone else, and then by being asked by someone else to talk about his experience with women, and what is it like to be married, and so forth, it dawns on him that he has rejected that. He has uh, deprived himself of that, in a sense, you know? I mean, the reason I think you understand from the movie that he's been for since World War II up in the mountains teaching these children is because he is saying no to violence. He wants to do what, you know, Camus talks about. I reject it utterly. I reject the silliness and the conflicts of, of the city, of politics. I just want to do good. And my way of doing good is to teach these children and to live a very simple life, almost like a monk, you know? Um, and, and Mohammed has some of that as well, you know? He has deprived himself. He's sacrificing himself. And I think that Dawu does this almost, it's almost like he realizes this in those sequences that that's something that he's, he needs to get back or he needs to re-experience. And it's hard to say. We talked a lot about what, where does he go? What happens, you know? Mm. Um, some days, you know, the director said, well, he leaves. He has to leave the country. I said, I don't think he leaves. I don't think he leaves. Well, where do you think he goes? I said, well, maybe he goes to Oran or he goes to somewhere else. And I think he stays around. We'd have these debates. It doesn't really matter. I mean, what I like about a story like this is that in the end, you walk out, if it's told well enough, you're interested enough to say, well, now what? What happens to Muhammad? Will he be welcomed? Will he be taken care of? Will he be shot? Will he starve to death? Uh, what will happen to these guys? And because the story, at least as far as I'm concerned, works, I, I really care about them. And we had lots of sort of silly arguments about it, but we never, we never decided, obviously. We were going to shoot for, how many of you have read the short story? Some, yeah. Uh, as you know, the ending, there's a different thing that happens uh, in terms of uh, what Muhammad decides to do. And, you know, some have questioned that. Or oh, is that a cop out or is that something that's not as gritty as the story? And we were going to shoot both versions, both decisions. But the closer we got to it, we shot it towards the end of the shoot. And by that time, we'd gotten to know these characters so well. And because of the journey they've made and the fact that Daru wants to convince him to make a certain choice, but he doesn't impose it on him. Yeah. He respects the free will. He has an agency to do that. Yeah, mm -hmm. and he has, gives his reasons and passionately and so forth. He gets annoyed about it. But in the end, he's like, okay, whatever you decide to do, good luck, you know. God bless you, and he walks away, and then he looks back. He doesn't know, and but we, uh, David said, you know, let's not shoot the other version. I think that the way we've told the story, it earns this. Yeah. It earns Muhammad making that choice, because basically what Daru is trying to convince Muhammad of during the whole story is to choose life, choose life generally and specifically, and in the end he realizes that he's also telling himself that. Which is what I'm referring to when I say about this. He's, there's a part of him that's been dormant, that he's repressed, you know? And it's like, whoa, you know, I have to tell you. Do you view the character as a teacher? Teaches him to come to life? Yeah, but he respects the kids, you know, the, the young man's choice. You know? I, I'm being given signs that we have very little time. So I think I'm going to take t one more Two more very quick questions. I'll take them together. I'll try to be faster then, with my answers. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm there, I mean, it's, it's so fascinating to hear about the process, but uh, we really have to be short. So this gentleman and then the, the lady at the back had her hand up for a long time. Mm. A short question. Sure. Yeah. Could you speak to the idea that the, the instructor belonged to the land, and perhaps that uh, deleted scene that you spoke about would have been uh, would have strengthened the, the idea? That His belonging in the community. Yeah, Maybe, but I think you see, you see him, you see the way he relates to objects. Uh, I think you feel, and the way he walks through the land with Muhammad, he's equally at home in, these, in this environment, I think. But uh, yeah, I think it would have been more of a tie to the community. But maybe this thing I was talking about before, 
this, that he's deprived him, himself of community in some sense, even though he has these kids and loves them and loves to teach them, maybe that helped to show that something's missing, but yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Deborah. I'm very pleased to meet you. I've been a big fan a long time. I wanted to know two things. Is Andalusia, that was a very interesting um, segment in the film. Where I, I, I don't know if that's Basque, but it's an area where there is racism against them by the rest of Spain, right? That was my one question, and then... Andalusia is in the south. <clears throat> the Basque country is in the northwest. Okay, but there's still... <coughs> the, north. the rest of Spain doesn't always like the people from Andalusia so much, right? Mm. So well, there's, uh, there's, there's dislike for the yeah. Catalans in the so north. That helped me have Depends where you are. Relate to the character, but also I want to ask you, um, it was the reason for having him be from there, or his family having yes. come from there, is because historically, a lot of people came from there and from places like uh, also Alicante, and where Camus' Cam mother came from, from Menorca, from the Baleares oh, Islands, okay. because those were the places where there was least, most, most poverty. So that's oh, simply so why. So relate to that. And then the other question is about Israel. I'm planning to move there quite shortly, and he's from Israel. Um, ha has it been released there yet, and what has been the reaction? Was it at the Jerusalem Film Festival? I don't know, you mentioned. Uh, I don't know, if, I don't think it was there. Uh, but has it been released yet in the country? I know a distributor bought it, I don't know if they've shown it. I actually wrote an email to the distributor after we were in Palestine showing it in different uh. cities, um, asking what they were going to do, and I offered myself to go back and do yeah. Q A's there. Okay. Now, I don't know if. You didn't get the email, or if the fact that I first went to Palestine offended them. I have no idea. We I can only guess. I yeah. never heard from them. Oh. But I'm happy to go there and, oh. and hear okay. what, well, what Israelis think there, about but, it. Yeah. Too. But what is the name of the distributor? So I can ask when I, I get to... couldn't tell yes. you right now. All right. I'm just, I look it up. Anyways, I'm just interested to see because there's so many places, a great dialogue going on right yeah. now all over the country by artists, people in the arts particularly. Uh -huh. And it's really so getting the, stronger the film, and stronger. The film is on Netflix, actually. Yeah. And so can you can also there. get it on DVD. I, I hope it's going to be on television someday. Do you think it'll be on television to... here also? I think eventually, I would imagine some place like the Sundance Channel or yeah, something like wonderful. that. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Um, so I want uh, to, we're going to have to let Viggo Mortensen go so that he can go to the Miller Theater and read. Thank you.